Hey, well, thank you. That's good stuff. And we're actually getting close to the end of time. I know you, you have uh, limited time today with us, Joe. We appreciate uh, the time you spent uh, with us very, very much. Uh, but I uh, want to give you a few more minutes and you can stay around as much as you want, we, you, but when you need to leave, feel free to leave, you know, but um, I probably, I probably have um, 20 more minutes, probably kind of thing. So I, I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, so I, well, I, I hope somebody's been, you know, um, gracious with, sorry, I, I can't, you know, I'm of that crowd that I can't really read. Number one, I have dyslex dyslexic. I can't even say it now. But um, it's hard for me to read and communicate online at the same time. So are there any burning questions that somebody has that's still on uh, that, that Keith, you want me to? I, I thought Keith was kind of talking about something there. Keith, you want to pause it, what you were, uh, what you were thinking about? Yeah, this kind of goes back to just the learned behavior that I think you're talking about, Joseph. And again, thanks for being on. This conversation is fascinating. Um, you know, I know we all talk about digital natives. I, I have a 15 year old and a 12 year old. And I remember when, um, when it really hit me that digital is becoming a space um, in, in a way that, you know, I'm, I'm 40 years old. And so I still remember, you know, my first friend on social media being Tom on MySpace. And so, you know, all of these behaviors have become learned. I have an advantage of working at a remote, you know, ministry. So we, we work remote and, and that's been such a huge advantage, I think, in this season. We haven't had to do a lot to pivot and to learn all sorts of new technology. We just kind of fumbled our way through those over the years and, and I think got, got pretty good at it. So, but to go back to my kids, I, I remember there was a moment with my wife where, you know, my son, my youngest, who's 12, was just on video games, you know, all the time, just, just constantly on video games, you know, or wanting to be on video games, right? And so we're limiting and we're putting hours and restrictions like all good parents try to do. I'll be honest, a lot of that's gone out the window in this season, but, but it's been, you know, it's been this journey because for me growing up and my wife too, who had two brothers growing up, you know, video games are this like mind numbing, you know, um, almost seen as like, you know, rebellious and just, you know, don't let your kids do it, the danger of it. And, and, and certainly overuse and all those things have, you know, that that's a, an important conversation. However, what I discovered with my kids is gaming for them was different than it was from when I was a child. Because when I was a kid, social gaming was we all get in the room and we take turns fighting over the controller. And now my kids would rather be in their rooms on their headsets and they are connected. Literally, we lived in Chicagoland and we now live in Southern California. My, my kids play every week with kids both in our neighborhood, on our block, you know, in different zip codes that they go to school with and then literally in other states. And so to limit social or to limit gaming time for us, we had to reconsider what that looked like because it was actually a, a function of their social experience. Yes. And so I think again, that part of it and now watching my kids, how they've adjusted to like online school, they're waiting for their teachers to catch up with the technology. And I think there's something really fascinating there that the delivery system is broken. Yeah. Um, and yet they know how to use the tools. So the things that teachers need to teach, they can't actually teach because that younger generation needs to teach them how to use the tool. Right. So we just kind of live in this interesting time and it, it, it just kind of prompted this, this idea. Yes, we live in a, a day and age where, you know, we talk about digital natives, but how can we somehow in our churches let the, the tools of technology be given to young people to train? Is there something there? What are we missing? Because that disconnect to me is the difference between someone getting the information and experiencing the kind of community that will change their life versus, you know, um, the other, which I think we're seeing in, in some churches that feel disconnected in this season. And, and, um, and so, yeah, so those are just some of my thoughts going into it and how that will impact and influence generations going forward. Well, Keith, you have a great, uh, great insight. Um, you know, a lot of my colleagues, uh, I, I think it was, um, what, I was trying to remember who wrote this book. It was 
first name was Shane, and I can't remember his last name. It's not Claiborne, but somebody who was uh, really villainizing uh, digital and what it's quote unquote doing to our kids' brain and to our brain. And, and um, I remember being at a conference one time and I said, they said, it's changing your brain. I said, yeah. And they're like, well, aren't you worried? No. <laughs> no, I, I hope my brain changes. I, I, you know, um, reading a book changes your brain um, and so it's, yes, yeah, for instance, the, the whole, I'm going to get off on a tangent here and then I'll come back to, to you, but the, the whole issue about multitasking and villainizing multitasking, like it's not as good as doing one thing at a time. No, it's just that we haven't learned yet how to do multitasking well. Our brains will catch up and there'll be a time where we will have news reports and indication that if you do one thing that at a time you are not near as productive as you are by multitasking. It, that's the way humans work. We learn these things. And what you're showing us is we learn how to do gaming in a social way. And our kids uh, in particular, learn how to make those social connections and they are exactly the same, if not better, than being in the same room. Uh, I remember the first time my daughter taught me this. We were, my, my daughter was, you know, the first one in my house to text someone in the same room. And I thought, oh my gosh, what, what this world coming to? And uh, at the same time that I was looking at my screen going, you just text me what are you doing over there? She goes, well, I'm texting everybody, you know? And so she's like having conversations with people across the planet that she's known. And to take away that digital is to take away her friends, right? Just craziness. And so um, I, I, how do I come back to this? Can I push back a little bit on the multitasking thing? I, well, I agree that our brains are going to change some. Um, primarily what I've seen and I've, I've done some research on this in my years with student ministry and, and training with parents on this is that uh, when people have two and three screens going on at the same time, well, the way it's fundamentally changing their brain is they're losing the ability to focus deeply on things. Uh, it's, it, it's rewiring in them in such a way that they can't do deep work. Uh, and so uh, I've seen a change in myself and, and had to discipline myself where I used to, yeah, honestly could read and study for longer periods of time and then noticed I couldn't do that as, as well because of, uh, because of the amount of multitasking I was doing. So I, you know, I'm not uh, afraid of multitasking, but I do think on that particular point, the rewiring of the brain that might be taking place is people's inability to hold their concentration. Um, and, and that really concerns me because I think our society still really values people who can do deep work and, and come up with really, uh, concentrated efforts towards something like you did in writing your book. Um, if you were a multitasker who lost the ability to focus on things and you were doing too many stuff, it might've taken you three times as long to write that book, uh, as it would the ability to, to sit and focus and concentrate on something. That's just one part of what you were talking about, but the, the, the dangers in terms of this new digital world that we have, uh, while yes, it does rewire our brain, when you look at what Facebook and, um, and, and, and other social media platforms are doing, they've figured out how to rewire our brains to keep us engaged longer in shorter, in shorter segments. I mean, it's, it's like the video feature on Facebook. The next video plays automatically and it's usually less than five or you know five minutes long and then you're watching another one and you're watching another one and it rewards the brain i think we have to be really careful uh in terms of embracing multitasking so i i tell my kids no more than one screen at a time i don't let them watch tv and be on their phone uh and and so and it and the reasoning really is that idea of i don't want them so rewired that they can't focus for long periods of time on the same thing so let me ask you a question ben um, 
as you were as you were here today, were you on your phone at all while you were participating in this particular event? Oh, absolutely. So you had two screens today. Yeah. Yeah. So you no, no, listen, listen. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not suggesting in terms of uh, you know that that this is uh, uh, suddenly this world we're not in. And a matter of fact, it might even be an argument for this not being the same experience as being in a room with people. Um, when I'm muted and mostly listening, uh, there's a partial engagement that can be happening. And so uh, when uh, when it gets too cold in the room and I text my kid to turn down the AC, I feel like I can get away with that. And still, and still partially be present. I can't maintain real long conversations and actually feel like I got something out of this. Um, You know, uh, some short exchanges of information are a little bit different though than I think the concept of having a number of boxes open all at the same time uh, and trying to, to, to make contributions in each one of those boxes. Um, So I'm, I'm not saying I never do it. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't think it's entirely healthy uh, I, I've you know, gotten to the point where when it's time for me to do my reading for this course, my phone goes on airplane mode. Yeah. Uh, Joe, what, what do you think, Joe, about all this? <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that we're learning. Yeah. Um, and, and Ben, I, I totally respect your, your view on this. And I know I have a lot of colleagues who push on me all the time about this. Um, I'm just going to speak out of my personal experience, okay? Not, um, what I know is my brain never shuts off when I focus and deep think about something, meaning it only focuses on one thing. The, the brain does not ever just focus on that. We know in, in neuroscience, we know that to be true. It doesn't matter how deeply in focused you are, your brain wanders. Uh, that's why Facebook can get by with what they do, and they're, they're making that time shorter and shorter. I totally agree with that. But our, our brain naturally wanders. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it doesn't focus on one thing. It, uh, it, it's almost like it's hardwired not to. Um, and so my, my thought about it is, is that, yeah, we can turn all of our screens off. We can do whatever we want to, to, to quote unquote, focus on one thing, but our brain is the renegade. It, it will not cooperate with that. I think it can be trained though. I think there's a training toward that discipline of, of longer periods of concentration. Uh, and and I, my concern with embracing multitasking is that uh, maybe we're letting our, our brain completely off the reservation and <laughs> uh, in, in uh, training it even to just jump more than it, than it already does. Yeah. yeah. Keith, you want to jump in there? Yeah, yeah I was just going to add to that. Um, it's a fascinating conversation because I think we're, we're talking a lot now about, um, I feel a little out of my depth, start talking about rewiring the brain and things. But, um, but at the same time, it's, it's fascinating because there's this move right now towards short form content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I put Quibi in the, in the text, you know, and whether or not that's successful is not the point. Um, What is the point is someone put their finger in the wind and said for the generation with the shortest history mind, we're going to create a new experience. And talking the other day, and I didn't even know they uh, Quibi is a part of, um, T-Mobile, so they have it, you know, so they're, you know, talking to them about it and, and whether or not it's going to be something they're, they're going to enjoy. And the, the jury's still out on it, but I think the idea that we are living in a day and age where this is new reality. And so how do we manage it well, but then also how do we kind of unleash that, it, you know, in, in a sense that, hey, this is, this is the new way, this is what is happening. And, mm-hmm. and so I think there's a tension between you know, what, what has been, what is, and, and where we're all headed and what are the guardrails, you know, that we need to have up so that we don't hit a ditch and we don't just, you know, go headlong into something that we later back up from and go, Oh, wow, we, we might've missed it here. So are there like parameters or guidelines, ethics, as we move into this and we embrace these tools and digital technologies? 
can I add to that? I'd like to add to that question because I, I think you bring up a great point and I think it goes back to the four social spaces uh, and, and how the actual, I think, space impacts um, uh, the way that we use those things. So, uh, for example, I, in, in, in space where our people are alive at our churches, they seem to have a much different attention span related to the length of the service. But now that we've gone digital, everything's shorter. Mm -hmm. And so I do think the, the four different spaces uh, you know, uh, that, you, that you teach on that, I've been thinking a lot about that particularly lately is the way it's, in, it's, it's, it's relating to attention span and the way it's relating to this digital world. Uh, I think, because I, I, I don't want us to miss it either, but our videos have to be short now. And we, we've even been talking about when you're in Zoom, don't pray too long. Uh, because it's a similar prayers, people are just checking out. When we shoot videos and we end services, our prayers are shorter, our announcements are shorter. Everything is because of what it's what we're noticing. People just drop off. We can see when they quit watching. Small is tall in a postmodern culture. Yeah. Well, Ben, and I, I think that that's a great insight. Uh, the other thing is to realize that when they're live, they're checking out too in a long trip. Yeah, and, ben, I, I, and Keith, I do think that there are, we do need to have ethics and morals and, and guides. I'm not saying, you know, this is all uh, part of heaven's plan. Um, but I'm also trying to say it's not a part of hell's plan either. Um, so I, I really respect, Ben, what, what you've said. I, I have so many friends who just think I'm that crazy and so well, I, and i, I want to add i i do think that with every new major invention our brains have probably changed yep. you know when when life went from agriculture to industry when we got the automobile when the computer was invented and in home now when telephones began when tv began uh i'm sure you know i mean i was part of that generation really raised the first to have cable yep. um you know, we, we certainly, the, the vast amount of options. So I, I think change is coming with that uh, for sure. And I, I think we, I want to be on the, the front side, like Keith talked about, of reaching people where they're at, not resisting and saying, don't go there. Um, but with those guardrails. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's smart. 